15. And I forgot to start my, I thought I did, but I didn't. Okay. Again, we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, or chapter 9 there, and, uh, or chapter 2, verse 9. And then we're going to Romans chapter 2, verse 15. Again, we're looking at the second part, or I should say after the introduction, we're looking at the first part of the bounties of God, one of God's attributes. Again, in Romans chapter 5, verse 15, we see these words, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And notice the word many there and not all. Kind of an important part there about this. Verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one much more, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Then verse 20, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. In verse 21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So we see the limitless, the limitless wealth of divine grace flowing forth and multiplying itself in its objects, which is us. There is everlasting life. There is eternal life. Whether saved in Jesus Christ or lost to a dying world, there is everlasting life. So you're either going to spend that everlasting life in the lake of fire or in glory with God, one of the two, because we all are going to be raised again and go Somewhere, we just we were talking. Brother Lonnie and I were talking about how some believe that the grave is it. And once you're buried and put in there, there is no more. I had one fellow. He belonged to a four square gospel church, and he told me one time that he didn't believe in life after death. That he believed that when you go into the grave. Of course, you have to die first. So once you're dead and buried, you go into the grave, that's it. And I said, well, what's the punishment for sin? Well, not knowing God is hell. So that's what they believe. That they die, they're buried, that's it. And I'm thinking, okay, wait a minute. Not knowing God is hell. If you're dead <laughs> and you don't believe in eternal life, whether it's the lake of fire or heaven, then how are you going to know that not knowing God is, exists? Because you're dead. If you don't believe in any spirituality after death, then you're saying you're dead, you're dead. There's not any not knowing. See? And their concept was just like, it just blows you away. It's like, where do you get this stuff? You know? The foundation or moving cause of this is found in, in John. And you can turn there to John 1 and verse 16. But, but as you're turning there, when the only begotten son became flesh and tabernacled here for a season, mean he walked among us. Now, Brother Ray's talking about the tabernacle that 
was built. Well, that's what Christ did. He dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. It was as one who was full of grace and truth because we have been made joint heirs with him. It is written in John 1, 16, and of his fullness have all we received and grace for grace. Everything is for grace for those who believe in Jesus Christ. It was by grace in grace that we even have our existence today. It's by the grace of God that we even are able to breathe, walk, do anything. So then we want to look at God's love. Now we've been over this, but let's look at it again in this aspect, in this aspect of the benevolence of God. There has been neither reserve nor restraint in the outflow of his love to its loveless, unloving objects. The objects, of course, is us. He has loved his people with an everlasting love. Turn to Jeremiah 31, 3, if you would. Jeremiah Chapter 31 and verse 3. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. So because God loved us, and he loved us before the foundation of the world, and I'm talking about his elect people, then at the appointed time he drew us, gave us the faith that we needed to trust and believe in Jesus Christ. It was nothing that we could do. It was by him and him alone. We're saved by grace, but it's the faith that God gives us that we have the understanding to understand that. See, because the scripture says in, in Ephesians chapter 2, for by grace are you saved through faith. And it's not of yourselves, lest any man should boast. Not of works or anything that you did that was righteous. It was the grace of God. Wondrously, he manifested it. For when the fullness of time was come, he sent forth his son, born of a woman. And yes, he did so love the world as he to give his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Therefore, we read of his great love wherein he loved us, Ephesians 2, 4. I was showing my wife the other day. I said, look at this. And I showed her on YouTube. I think it was, I don't know, I might not have the number right. It was either 36 or 64. But Brother Ray got 64 hits on whosoever. So what that tells me is, well, first of all, people want to argue that who the whosoever's are. They don't want to believe that the whosoever's are the ones that God draws us by faith to believe in Jesus Christ. So they were interested in, I said, that's interesting that they would be interested in whosoever. Because it sparked something. I remember when I was at work all the time, we'd be sitting down at break or sitting down at lunch. And that's all them guys wanted to argue who the, who the whosoever's were. For God so loved the world that whosoever believe in him. Well, who are the whosoever? See, there's the greatest argument there ever. Well, it only can be one person. The whosoever are the ones that God saved before the foundation of the world. Through in Christ, he elected, he chose, he predestinated. 
And we became adopted children. Because God is the God of the Jews. And God and the Jews are married or will be once again. He divorced them for a while. But he'll get them back. But the Gentiles in Jesus Christ are bridegroom and bride. Those who are true and faithful to the end that are members of a New Testament Baptist church. Nobody outside of that is going to be able to be married to the bridegroom. There is specifics. Now, man, when you married your bride... There was specifics. You married her for a reason. Christ is doing the same thing. Paul said, I want to present the church to God in a white garment. There's without spot, without blemish, without anything wrong. I want to be able to present them to the Lord. Now, I don't know how many of you had a church wedding, but my wife and I had a church wedding. And when I seen her walking down the aisle, it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my whole life. So I can only imagine when the bridegroom cometh for his bride, how glorious of a day that's going to be. Can two walk together unless they be agreed? No. So why would Christ be married to a harlot? Because outside the Baptist church, that's what there is. There is nothing. There is no pure, even though we're human beings and we make mistakes, the church is pure and perfect in Christ Jesus. The Greek word translated, you can turn to Matthew 9.37 in 1 Peter 1.3. Matthew 9.37 and 1 Peter 1.3. See, the Greek word translated great is rendered plenteous in Matthew 9.37. Then... We see the word abundant in 1 Peter 1 3. So there is a great, plenteous abundance of the love of God in his people. Love, unmeasured, that passes knowledge, fills our lives with its unceasing ministrations, ever active in priesthood and advocacy. On high, how truly is it is love abundant. God's love is abundant. Imagine if God wouldn't have loved us. What would have happened to us? And I'm not talking about the world because God does. I mean, you know, God doesn't love every single person. Jesus doesn't love every single person. I mean, just because the bumper sticker says Jesus loves you or God loves you, that's about as false of a statement as you can be. What God loves, what Jesus loves is his, his elect, his own, the ones he chose before the foundation of the world. Those are the ones he loved and Christ died for, no more, no less. And I know people don't want to hear that. Because that's saying, well, you're saying not all people are going to be saved. That's right. That's what exactly what I'm saying. Not all people are going to be saved. That's why the word many is used and not the word all. But they can't separate them. So our present theme, the bounties of God, is unexhaustible. There's no end to it. The bounties of God. Our Lord came here that his people in John 10.10 10, might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And that's marvelous. 
This was first made good when Christ, as the head of the new creation and the beginning of the creation of God in Revelation 3, 14, breathe on his disciples, receive ye the Holy Spirit. That's what he did. Go back. Go to Revelation 3, 14. Revelation 3, 14. Brother Ray was just quoting this scripture to me. You see there right above verse 14, some of your Bibles would have this, some of them maybe not. This is talking to the church of the Laodicean. And Brother Ray has preached for years, and I agree with what he's said. We are in the Laodicean dispensation. This church that Christ is talking to is the church that exists today on earth. This is what they're doing. And unless they hear Jesus and open up the door and let him in, then they're going to fold. These churches aren't going to continue on. They're going to cease to exist and I believe the word Ichabod is going to be written across the door and they're going to end because they did not listen to him. It says, and unto the angel to the, of the church of the Laodicean right, these things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And he says there, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. When you become lukewarm, you can read the rest of it, but when you become lukewarm, he says, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Now, I don't know how many of you like cold coffee. I mean, not iced coffee. I'm saying cold coffee. You've got a nice hot cup of coffee. All right? And I do this all the time. I got a cup of coffee. I go back to my office, and I get busy, and I'm sitting there, and I go to grab, and I go to drink a, the coffee, and pew, man. Rotten stuff, because it's lukewarm, right? <laughs> I mean, I've kind of learned to just drink it and not, don't mind it so much, but it's not as good as hot coffee. And I like, I like iced coffee, but not lukewarm coffee. There's just something about it. So that's what the Lord's saying. If you're lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. I don't want you lukewarm. I want you to be doing something or not doing something. Either sit there and do nothing or get with the program and get hot about it. See, that's what he's saying. And if we take a look at our churches today, that's what's going on. That's what's happening. And there's a penalty for that. And I don't know why some of these preachers aren't getting a, <laughs> getting a picture, but they're, I'm telling you that they're not. It was the risen Savior communicating his resurrection life to his own. Now we'll compare. Turn to Genesis 2-7 for the beginning of the old creation. You can see there what God did. Genesis 2-7. And the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground, and there it is, and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. He became a living soul. So to when that same one who down here received the Spirit without measure in John 3, 34, ascended on high as the glorified man, he baptized his people in the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2. And I would encourage you to read that and see what happened. 
Acts chapter 2. We see the same thing happening with Cornelius. It's the only two places you're going to see it. It's a guy I worked with, super nice. He was a black preacher. And I said, came in Monday morning. I said, well, how, how was church services yesterday? Sorry, it was great. He said, the Holy Spirit came in and we got up and left. <laughs> I said, what? I said, I said, I, excuse my ignorance, because I always made it out like I didn't know what, you know, what in the world's going on. And I said, can you explain that to me? He said, yeah, we come in the services. And when we feel that the spirit of God comes in, whatever we're doing, we stop and we leave. And I said, well, what if you're in the middle of a sermon? He said, don't matter. When we feel the spirit come in, we just stop and go. I said, what about when you're singing? He says, well, don't matter. Whenever we feel the spirit come in, we get up and leave. I said, you could be there all day. He said, yeah. <laughs> but this is a concept. Now, so he didn't like this. But I said, well, let me ask you something. I said, when the spirit comes in, I said, is there a fire dancing on everybody's head? It looks like a clove, you know, a clove, a fire dancing on their head. And he gave me this like stern look. And I said, well, see, the reason I'm asking, because the only two places I've ever seen in scripture where the Holy Spirit comes in, the clove of fire is dancing on their head. And a mighty Russian wind. I said, was there a mighty Russian wind? He just kind of walked away. <laughs> See, I mean, look. I don't understand that when it's right there flame. It happened twice like that. If it happens anymore, shouldn't it be the exact same? Why would it be different? If the Holy Spirit comes in... Why would it be any different than the two accounts that we have in Scripture? So it brings me back to, you know, somebody said, well, when there's something's wrong or you want to prove something, you always go to the Scripture. <laughs> that's right, because that's all I have. I don't know what you want me to do. As the Apostle Paul assures Gentile saints, he shed, he shed on us abundantly. Abundantly in Titus 3.6. Once more, he emphasized the professness of God's bounty. God's bounty is just, well, it's just beyond measure. It's unmeasurable. If we serve God in the way that we're supposed to serve God and do what we're supposed to do, then the bounties of God will be so great that we won't even be able to handle it. And when I look at people today, Christian people, and I say, they don't want it. They don't want the bounties of God because if they wanted the bounties of God, they would sure act a little bit different than they are, right? That's the way I see it. May God bless his word to your heart today.